Because if you own your own memory, you've got some capacity to envisage your own future. He tanga tawhakatau waike nga e tanga kare e me. He uhu manea. He au mō kapua. He ranga tira. He tanga tawhakatu tū puehua noho ki e te iwa. E ngari keia e te iwa i a rā noa atu ngā kōrero e pāna ki aia. E ngari te o te ngāke a neira te kōrero a tā tīpene O'Regan. Ko tīpene O'Regan tēne e te iwa. Indigenous 100. E te ranga tira. E tā tīpene te ngā hoa. Tēnā koe hoki, Julian. Tēnā koe ko whakarau mai koe ki tēnei kaupapa, uh, te rau wo taketake. Thank you for being a part of Indigenous 100. To begin with, and I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I want to go back to the night before the third reading of the Ngai Tahu Claims Settlement Act. My understanding is that you receive a phone call before the final reading from, I think, the leader of the opposition at the time, saying that the numbers to pass the act may or may not be there. If I've got that wrong, you'll correct me. I will. Okay. Uh, talk me through the, the general aspects of, of, that, of that conversation, of, of what happened, when you received a phone call about numbers may not may or may not be there in terms of passing of them. The third reading of the Settlement Act was down for a Thursday. And on the Sunday preceding, I received a call from the then Prime Minister, Dame Jenny, or she wasn't Dame then, but Jenny Shipley. And Prime Minister Shipley told me that she was very worried they didn't, she thought they might not have the numbers to pass the bill and that Labour was not going to support the settlement. Uh, and Labour was being led by Helen Clark at the time. Helen Clark at the time. And I rang my wife and told her, you must appreciate at that point it was a, pretty huge thing because we've been eight years negotiating this thing. And the previous 147, 40 years, seven generations of Seven generations, yes. yeah. And uh, I, um, my wife Sandra said to me that you must bring David Cagle immediately. Now David Cagle was an old friend of Naitahu, but he was no longer in Parliament, but he still had considerable influence amongst his colleagues and uh, I rang him and he just said leave it with me and he flew to Wellington and he got himself invited into a Labour caucus meeting and he spoke to, he spoke to, I presume he spoke to Prime Minister, uh, sorry, to Helen Clark, the leader of the opposition beforehand. But he came out of that meeting uh, knowing that the Labour caucus would support it. And so on the, I think by this time it was Tuesday evening and I was in the old Fisheries Commission offices in Mulgrave Street and uh, I got his message and he said you must wait till you hear from Helen. And a short time later I got a phone call from Helen uh, with a couple of conditions about <coughs> how I should conduct myself <laughs> and um, I agreed that I would so do. And I um, 
rang poor media parata in the Naitaho office, and I said, start up the buses. But preparations had already been made, had they, oh, not yes. to start we, moved, we, getting the iwi mobile to Wellington? Oh, for yeah, the we had all that sort of thing, getting the iwi up there. There was two buses of people from Maui, people from Kahununu and Napier were coming, and people from all over were coming. Did you see your life flash before your eyes when you received the phone call on Sunday night that potentially this might not get through? No, uh, not necessarily, because I'd been in that space before. You've been in the space before where, where plans I've been in the space before because um, it came a very close thing back in 90, after 94 when the Honourable Doug Graham broke off negotiations with us and um, we had kept turning up at the table and uh, said, um, he was wanting to say, Negotiations had broken down. I was insistent on saying the crown broke off. <laughs> so these rather, you might think them uh, silly ego games went on. But the most important thing was that in that period, I started preparing to lock down the total block of Naitahu evidence on the basis of there was not going to be a settlement and it was not going to go through, uh, that uh, we would uh, we could wait another generation. You were prepared to do that though? Yes. Did you not think though that if, what because I did of the not role want that to happen, yeah. What I did not want to happen was that I did not want us to lose the enormous uh, corpus of work and effort and evidence and hearings and documentation and everything that we'd prepared over that period of before the tribunal, for the tribunal, during and after, recording the negotiations, recording the interactions, uh, the valuations, and all of those sorts of things that we did. Uh, I didn't want that to be lost and have to be started over again. Mm -hmm. So we were had a plan B of how to lock the whole thing down and let the next generation take it up. And and so you held on to that right at that time in 1990. Right up at that point, up till that point, right through those points. To my last interaction with Prime Minister Bolger, he was standing on the Maui gas platform, I think, with a cell phone. And I was in the office in Christchurch. And um, I knew we didn't need the plan B. I thought we didn't. Uh, when I said the words, Prime Minister, you have a settlement. How did that feel when you uttered those words to Prime Minister Jim Bolger? Went outside, lit my pipe, and bawled my eyes out. Heavy, heavy stuff. But um, I'm, uh, excuse me being a little lacrimosal now, but with the recollection of it, but it was a, uh, when you're right at the wire, it's very lonely. All your allies and all your friends are all looking at the floor, looking at the ceiling, looking out the window. They're listening, but you get no signals from them. You and you're absolutely on your own. Did you have a sense of confidence, though, that you were the right man for the job? Well, there wasn't anyone else. <laughs> I, I knew what I had to do. You've got to appreciate that our great challenge was over those seven generations of Tikedami, Naitahu claims. The claim itself had become our culture. And we had had to, as we came within 
when there became the possibility of a settlement on the horizon. In the circumstances of the day, the uh, politics of the day, we could see the possibility that we might get a settlement. And um, so we started asking ourselves, what for? And we started running a parallel process of a set of what I might call constitutional conventions, largely gatherings at Aro Whenua Marae, because that's the house to Hapo New Tiriani, built for the claim, the grievances of New Zealand. And so we'd had to envisage how we wanted to start envisioning, how we wanted to be as a people, what we wanted to be minus a grievance, why we wanted to be what we wanted to be. We had to start dreaming a bit about how we could be and asking questions that most people hadn't asked themselves in their lifetime. Mm. And uh, the, uh, and having to get them to exercise their imaginations. Because most of our people don't get up in the morning and finish their wheat bags and say, what am I going to do about the Constitution of New Zealand today? <laughs> or what am I going to do about Tamir, Tamir, Tamir? They live ordinary lives doing ordinary things. We had to get our heads out of that frame. But you have always done that. You have always, this is my experience of you, that you have always had that thing in the puku that gets you up in the morning thinking about tough issues that need to be resolved. Yes. Where does that come from? That largely comes from the influence of my father and a long heritage of, uh, in his family of what I might broadly call Christian socialism, uh, which I was in a very liberal tradition rather than socialistic. And so I always used them, the Henry Shaw, the uh, uh, premier for a time, and also the superintendent of Canterbury, one of his great lines was, first, the first plank of public policy must be to stamp out the beastly communism of the Maori. And I used to stand there and I says, my mission is to restore the beastly communism of Naito. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, James Edward Fitzgerald, the man who founded the Christchurch Press, he, he averred that the great mission of the settler state was to burn down the dreaded Whareipuni. And uh, I said, my mission is to rebuild it. Mm -hmm. And uh, otherwise, what's the claim for? And so I have had this uh, driving vision that I've shared with a number of people. The late uh, Horry Forbes of Tainui, to some extent a bit less, but perhaps with uh, Te Kotahi, uh, Robert Mahuta, uh, Apirana Mahuika. Um, those uh, People and most important in a personal sense to me was uh, John Rangiho Tuhoi, um, These are people whose association with them, and then a few Komatua, uh, notably um, uh, Hohipeni, uh, Sophie Carr of Nati and um, uh, Rangi Pokeha of the Whanganui Tati Honui Apaparangi. Mm. These are people who, in different ways, gave me huge insights to different things and who trusted me with their own takas. And I cut my teeth on some of them. The first mm. land claim I ever was successful with was recovering the Ngati Pomoana Māori School at Koroniti on the Whanganui River. And uh, before I, I cut my teeth on that, and sundry other battles for uh, 
the one for Koro Jews on the house of Mohine Waipu, Waipu, at the mouth of the Waipu River. They were in a coastal accretion argument, which I got into for Koro and um, things like that. The, the, all that experience and association from the Māori Graduates Association and things like that, that had sharpened my thinking as I was turning my attention more forcibly to mm. my own people. Because all those people are ex exceptional leaders in their own right. I mean, you talk about Lakini Pōkeha, Te Rangiha, an extraordinary scholar, extraordinary leader for Tūhoi. You become, in, in essence, their contemporary collaborator and a leader in your own right for, for, for Ngaitahu. What did you learn? What specifically did you learn from them? What unique aspect of leadership, Māori leadership, Indigenous leadership, that you learned from them that you continue to hold now, that most sticks with you now? That... All of them manifested a some sort of vision, quite different, many of them, about how things should be. Um, not just grievances or righting wrongs, but beyond that, when we've got this thing sorted out, how do we want to be? And John Tarangiha was essentially bred to the task of bringing his people out of the bush and into the wider world. And um, the two old men, two brothers, Rurihe, who very largely brought him up, uh, particularly Te Kapua at Waikaramoana, had some prof quite profound influence on me. Mm. But they were... They were very generous to me, and for a time, it was only Ian Pryor, the epidemiologist, Professor John McCreary, who taught Tarangi Ho at Victoria University, uh, and myself. We're the only, about the only three uh, non-Tuhoi that were basically legitimately within their takiwa, uh -huh. in their view. And, uh, they were interesting people in their own right, those other chaps. And uh, they were good friends of mine too. So I was quite, uh, I was enormously favoured. But... Um, Why? Why do you think you were favoured? Well, they obviously saw something in me that I hadn't really seen in myself. I've never been particularly introspective until I've arrived in my uh, uh, neo-geriatric uh, world. Um, the, uh, I've always been more interested in issues and questions uh, than I have in the act of interpersonal things. And um, my wife has often commented this is one of my primary failures, <laughs> that I, I take people as I find them and uh, I'm far too accepting. <laughs> but that, that might not be a comment from that, that she, she is alone, to be fair. It might be <laughs> within your other members of your immediate family too. But, uh, mm. Yes, oh well, they all tend to follow her general direction. <laughs> Um, the um, the point that I'm making is that that background of issues on my from my father's side comes through a couple of generations of mm. activity. I had a very very remarkable grandfather mm. on my father's side, and he was a passionate advocate of the home rule for Ireland, mm. even though he never went there. He went from the west coast to Wellington to Nelson, occasionally to Auckland, uh, to defend Bishop Liston and back to the west coast. And, but he had a very distinguished career and left an ama amazing historical legacy 
in his diaries, which are huge volumes of close typed documents. Mm. And as a small boy, I used to have a run of my father's study and I used to pull down um, a volume of the diaries and I'd, after school sometimes, I'd get out of doing the chores, I'd be down in Dad's study and I was always left alone there. But if the old fella saw that I had An left, the, left the book open, yeah. uh, he'd start quizzing me. So then I was told, when you find things, you make a write down the page and a two-word reference to it, and you just make your list up. And then we'd, I'd drive the family mad at dinner by a conversation between me and my father on what I was wanting to understand out of Granddad O'Regan's diaries. <laughs> and the rest of them sport out of their wits. Dinner was a a debate or an engagement between my father and myself. Why, why do you think your father uh, encouraged that? Why do you well, he was a polymath in his own right. He was a person who thought very widely of a wide range of things. He was an absolute top-end surgeon, mm. and he had a very distinguished surgical and medical career. But he also wrote books on uh, essays on New Zealand defence policy. He wrote on land value taxation. He was a great admirer of the American uh, Christian socialist, uh, Henry George, a single tax man. And uh, uh, he had a firm belief in Crown Leasehold, which I don't share, but uh, I respect the, the arguments. He sounds like an extraordinary man, your father. He was, uh, but... He'd take me out walking on the occasional weekend and we'd... I remember these winter walks in wet bush. He had a belief that you should never walk in the bush unless it was wet because you could smell it. It was different. And I'd be trudging along with my little backpack and the waterproof cover over Cotton's Geomorphology of New Zealand. Lang and Blackwell's native plants of New Zealand, which I still have, and um, a little book of reads on uh, A. W. Reed on um, Maori proverbs and place names, and the old fellow would march through the bush in his army shorts, carrying his little swag with the billy for making the cup of tea, and uh, I'd have my pack with the little books in it these three books, and he'd be singing everything from Latin hymns to uh, uh, Irish uh, independent songs, <laughs> and happy as Larry, and I'd be trudging along behind, and we'd climb up to some damn hill out on a windswept Cook Strait coast, and he'd get to the top, and he'd look down and say, look at the shape of that hill, boy. How do you think that was made? <laughs> Dead. I don't know. I, I, I always I always restrain myself from saying I don't care. Right? <laughs> and how old were you? Sorry, just, just oh, I was just 10, 11, Wow. Twelve. You'd say, "Look it up, sir. Look it up." And I have to sit out there and look it up and work out how this hill was made and why the wave patterns in the Terrafati Rip was the way they were and uh, all this sort of thing. And occasionally he'd bowl a rabbit and he'd sit there as happy as Larry dissecting it and trying to um, explain to me the wonders of anatomy mm. while the billy boiled. And, and expect you to remember it. Uh, Julian, what I'm trying to explain to you is how I inherited a sense of victimhood from my mother, but also from my father. <laughs> okay, so let's and talk I lost all interest in anatomy at that point. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about your mother, because your mother is, she was the, she's Naito. She's Naito. From Avodua, from uh, apparently uh, she heaven was an girl. She was born at uh, Koputai, yeah. uh, Port Chalmers. Yeah. And... Um, in 1900, 
and she was four years older than my father. Uh, but she'd, uh, she was the son of a, uh, I'm sorry, the daughter of a um, Naitahu master mariner. He was a master mariner on both sail and steam. And he'd been first mate of uh, the uh, Hinemoa and the Tutanakai under Cap the famous Captain Bollins. Mm. And so he'd mapped and surveyed much of the Subantarctic Islands and mm. the southern regions. And um, uh, I, I, he died when I was a very small baby. But I have heard many accounts of him from his sons, my uncles. And they were regularly quoting him. And they'd be quoting him, kept quoting Captain Bollins. And if there, was, there was no higher level of scriptural authority in our family than it emanated from Captain Bollins. Mm. Mm. And uh, trust in God, Etama, in the Admiralty Chart. That's what Captain Bollins used to say to the old man. And by that implication, that was something I had to remember. Uh, so the, the reason why I'm, I'm interested in your parents, for a number of reasons, but in particular because your mother's the Naito, Ruiha, the Naito. No, Rena. Rena, Rena, sorry, Rena, 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 Rena Ruiha. Yeah, Rena yeah. Ruiha. But, but it, it's your, it's it your was, father. It was her, it was her, her mother. Rena, also Rena, Rena Harawata or Harwood, who was the keeper of the claim to the Kerimi in our fam in our extended family. She never missed a claim meeting on the claim. She sent notices to everyone, and she engaged my father's attention in the Naita claim. Mm. And uh, my father very rapidly became her prime go-to man. Wow. And uh, my father misused his authority at some time to get a direct phone line put into her house. <laughs> Otherwise, everyone in Bluff was on party lines. Yeah. And she'd be ringing up to talk about matters to do with the claim and he'd be uh, writing articles for the Labour Party paper, The Standard. I remember one of them was a great headline, Disinheritance by Inflation. <laughs> Uh, and it was. It was, a, yeah. it was quite startling. When did you first know that there was an expectation that you would pick up in some way, shape or form some responsibilities for the Kereme? <sighs> Not till I was actually as a fresher at university in about 58, 1958 I think it was. Might have been 57. But the then chairman of the Naitahu Trust Board, Frank Winter, he was a tamati from Natiyadeke, whatever. He um, and his wife was a pearl tairo from Otaku. And uh, he'd been well blooded in the early days in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, with the Naitahu Census Committees and Naitahu Claim Committees and those things. And uh, he'd become the chairman after 1953 of the Naitahu Māori Trust Board, which was broke at that time. And my mother was a great supporter of his. And uh, the uh, Frank Winter started made it very plain, very quickly, that if I was going to be at the university and I wanted some help with my grant for my books, I think I got £25 for my university books my first year. Uh, made it very plain that responsibilities came with that. And so I was expected to join the University Māori Club, of which he and Pearl were the, um, uh, the uh, patrons. And... Uh, I was fairly regularly on call from about that point on to put on my blazer and tie and go down to his office in, in Lampton Quay. He had a day job there next door to a man called Russell Feast, a lawyer, who was the lawyer for Tuwharetoa, 
And uh, when Happy was in town, I'll be summoned in there and I'll have to go and sit and be listening and, and uh, trying to work out why I was being sought to be there. But very quickly I learned that as I was studying law, I was expected to be able to read and write. And I should, uh, even though I didn't proceed with the law, much to his disappointment. But um, uh, I started the business of assisting with drafting petitions. In those days, change was quite incremental. You put one, two, three, four petitions into Parliament and they went to the Petitions Committee and you made submissions to the Petitions Committee and then if it was successful, or some, you know, they're all about the level of changes to the subsidy on hinges for the Whareipaku doors at <laughs> some place, you know. And um, you'd... Uh, uh, or Marae subsidies and things of that kind. And what you did was you, um, if that was successful, there'd be an amendment in the Māori Affairs washing up bill at the end of the year. And what you learned was, you, because you're not ever allowed to repeat a p petition if it fails, you learned to frame your petition in such a way that you could reframe it so it could argue, be argued cogently and successfully, hopefully. Uh, that it was not the same petition that had failed last year. Mm. And on this sort of slow accretion of, or accre advanced by accretion, I'd call it, but the way you get built up on the beach over time, we were changing the condition of our people. And uh, so I was doing that for him and then so happy got me to do a few of those for him. And of course, Russell Feast could have done them in 10 minutes, but it was all a way of giving me the experience of dealing with bringing them. Bringing you in. So that was a part of my beginning of my relationship with Tahepi. Mm. To come back to the Frank Winter, because he's the chair of the Ngaitaho Trust Board for, I think, about 20 years. And then you end up becoming the chair of the Ngaitaho Trust Board. And I wonder how important that time with Frank Winter was in enabling you as a leader in your own right, as the chair of the trust board, and also as the leader of the Ngaitahu claim. Well, he wasn't terribly happy with me because I gave up law and went away to sea for a period. And uh, he felt that I'd let the side down a bit. But finally I moved back the set of circumstances got me into the teacher's college with my wife Sandra. Mm. We had a three-month-old baby, I think, when we went there, maybe a bit more. And um, they were, they revolutionised my mind, I think, uh, those two years, because I had some very influential people uh, Keith Fox, the geographer, Barry Metcalf, who was a very well-known uh, activist on all sorts of issues, but an enthusiastic uh, um, teacher of uh, Māori and Polynesian studies, which I think he'd been infected with during his time at um, um, Manganui College in Taitokura. Mm. Uh, and... Uh, George Webby, the dramatist, and uh, Phil Armstrong, the mathematician, who's only recently died, who was a... And they're an extraordinary little collection of people that I was associated with. Mm. So after a couple of years teaching, I was seconded back to the Teachers' College as a lecturer. And uh, a very youthful age to be a lecturer in a Teachers' College. Yeah. And I was to stay there 13 years until I was head of department of Māori and New Zealand Studies. And, and at the same time, you're doing work for... No, no. Okay. But so, it was when I moved back in to Wellington that, uh, and Frank was dying, that he started calling me over to his house. It was quite close to mine. And I'd spend time there with him and I'd go home and he'd let me have one book of Whakapapa, which I'd take home and transcribe, and I take that back, 
give me another one. Did you know at the time that this was a part of, oh, for what Well, he word. then put the hard word on me, said, I'm not going to get out of this bed. So he said, I want you to succeed me. How did you feel seat. at the time? I didn't want a bar of it. <laughs> Why not? Well, because it was all about fighting for parity with the Consumer Price Index and the Naitahu Settlement Payment. I said, and I wanted to know about our traditional history. I wanted to know about our story. I wanted to know where we'd come from. I was intrigued by this whole amazing way in which our people in the 17th century had moved out of that great amalgam of iwi in the Heritanga, Mahia down into the Heritanga, and uh, into the Waipanamu and had been fundamentally reshaped by the land itself. Mm. Uh, how they become this southern Ngaitahu. There was just as much Ngaitahu Whakapapa still hanging around the back of the Napier Wharf today. But their, how they developed this identity, that captivated my interest. And, uh, but I was interested in the ethnology. I was interested in all the mahinga kai and the technology. And this amazing adaptation, that's where I started developing my underlying thesis of my view of Maori and Polynesian mm. people. So, so it's a story of dynamic adaptation, and it was that the dynamism and that adaptation that uh, captivated me. Yeah. And so, so you, d you didn't have any concern about the fact that you'd have to take up this role because of the responsibility that went with being the chairman of the board of having to lead the claim. It was because you had other interests. No, no, I got I, I got parity with. Uh, um, we couldn't get uh, the Naitahu claim made adjust, uh, adjustable to the consumer price index. And there wasn't much point because it was only running for 30 years and it was all over. And so the first effort was to get the Naitahu claim made, payment made perpetual, like the other tribes, uh, which we were. I was successful in. Maturata brought that change in, fiercely opposed by Fetu Tirukatni Sullivan, who's uh, um, also of the Labour Party, but she felt that it was uh, defaming or traducing the settlement agreement from 1946 made by her father, and she took very deep offence at that. And uh, well, we pulled that off. But that, that day, we pulled it off. The then secretary of the Naitahu Trust Board said to the board one day, um, uh, well, there's not much point the board meeting more than once a year. All you need to do is you've got to you decide whether you want to continue with the two-thirds, one-third, two-thirds investment, one-third distribution rule uh, of a devaluing currency forever. Uh, you need to meet once a year to tell us the, how you want it distributed and the office can do everything else and you can save the costs. And uh, well, I said, well, if that's all we are, we're wasting our time. And I wasn't very... So I, I agreed to go on the board. But once I got that done, I said, no, we've got another battle. We've got to try and, we've fought like fury to get the tribunal, the Aitangi tribunal rules changed to 1840. Uh, we've done that and we've done this. And we've got an opportunity. We've got to put the claim back on the road. Did you believe you could win at that time? No, but I saw a route by which we might. Did you have supporters in terms of your plan for that route, or was it one that you... I was able to develop them? But initially, you were you were the one mapping out that route. But I yeah, but there's others. There's my colleague and deputy, uh, subsequent deputy chair, Taraki uh, Hato, sort of said, "Yeah, we can do that," and uh, wasn't quite sure what we were going to do, but he thought it was a good idea. My mate Bill Solomon just sort of said, 
Yep. <laughs> and um, there was no disagreement. So uh, I regarded that as permission to proceed. <laughs> and um, before very long, it all got a bit too heavy for the Frank's successor, Wudamu Torepe. Poor old Bill felt he was getting a bit behind the eight ball with it. And so he decided to retire. He's a lovely man and a very conscientious and devoted chairman. But he had been a backer of the predecessor and I was the one who'd basically done the reading and writing. Mm. So it's about that point where I take over writing the Naitahu. Sid Ashton did the financials and I wrote the Naitahu annual report. Mm. We had all sorts of issues going as yeah. well. But, which, and, and at the time, you're labelled a troublemaker. Oh, yeah. yeah. You, uh, New Zealanders were being told that you were, well, you, you were apparently public enemy number one to the then Prime Minister, Sir Robert Muldoon. Well, I regarded him as public enemy number one. <laughs> You weren't alone in that view either, I'm sure. But. I know, I know. And I sympathise very largely with the other people who share my views. But, <laughs> the, um, but, you, but you were also labelled, and I'm pretty sure I'm right in this, you were labelled uh, um, at one stage New Zealand's most hated man or, or, or similar. Yes, but that's, you've got to remember the people who say those things. Um, you've got a few of them now. I could list them for you. But, but how do you deal with that? How do you deal with those who, even if they don't share... The only thing I really dealt with is by the people who took it out on my children at the Kelvin Normal School and the children who were tormented for their father being a, a dirty Māori activist and those sorts of things. But, so how did you deal with that? Because the, this, Well, it was difficult. Because the, your kids are, are, are being put at risk, aren't they? Oh, well, they were. They were being targeted. Yeah. But it's part of the course. When Jacinda Ardern said after the crisis, mosques, this is not us, all I could say was, oh, yes, it is. It is us. There was the man when you were out washing your car, comes down, used to come down Bibble Street, and you get these hate-filled eyes out of his car with a finger in the air and... Uh, I knew who he was. I found out who he was. Uh, there's the bricks through the children's bedroom window. There was the tutai wrapped up in nice parcels in your letterbox. All these other charming things from your fellow New Zealand citizens. And my wife Sandra has talked about this in the past, uh, about the hate and how she it was very difficult for her. And some of it came a bit close to home within the extended family. Within within your own whānau? Whānau, whānau. Uh, there was lots of sniffy jokes from some of my Pākehā relations. Usually witty, but nonetheless very hurtful. Um, there was uh, stuff from... Sandra's family, which was not uh, very pleasant and it was pretty hard on the children. So, yes, it was not a comfortable time and you were regularly being targeted and savaged in the papers. It always struck me as it was quite easy to talk about uh, Takere Amaratima, uh, also Graham Latimer, but uh, when my own people started calling me Tipe because my nickname in Kaitahu was always Tiwi, for Steve. My passport name is still Stephen. And um, indeed, for Air New Zealand, I've got to be Sir Stephen, because I've never changed my name by the deep pole. Um, but my own people started calling me Ta Tipe or Sir Tipe and uh, various other leaders did, and I adopted it. So when 94, when I was knighted at Aro um Dame Kath said, uh, 
Neil Sir Stephen, arise Sir Tipene. <laughs> so let's let's come back to how you navigate the troubled waters of race relations at the time and trying to get the claim settled. Well, the race relations things were difficult, and we were it was quite challenging because we were first off the rank. That's right. In a fully negotiated process, because Tainui never went to the tribunal, they cut a deal straight up with Doug Graham. And uh, we uh, went through the full long haul. The tensions were quite hard. Remember, we had had the Hun report in 1960. And Frank Winter and our Komatua were very cynical about that document. Uh, it was Frank Winter was actually the man who coined the term uh, integration in New Zealand, which was a, uh, a claim policy by the Hun report. Integration mm. meant integration is what the shark said to the snapper, let's integrate. And um, so even those old fellows were pretty cynical about the trend. Mm. They didn't have a lot of trust in Hannon, the Minister of Justice, who set up, made some very significant moves in these matters. They were more upset about him going off to the coronation of Queen Elizabeth, uh, wearing a kākahu, ki a kākahu kiwi from the National Museum um, to represent our Māori people. And they thought that was mm. really upset them, you see. But, so he was the great white father of Invercargill to my co so, But, but they were all Tories in their way. Those Komatua. So, how did you maintain the North Star? How did you maintain and keep progressing to Kremi despite? Because I had some sort of an inchoate dream, uh, ill formed, not refined, that we had to be something bigger as a people, as a culture. We had to be something more substantial uh, than a, uh, a people who could be bought off with some annual payments and a few scholarships. We can do all that stuff, and no doubt we'll eventually get to a stage where we've got a decent health program, a decent uh, way of helping our people of, uh, age more gracefully and better and more warmly. And we can do a whole lot of things. But unless you own your own memory, unless you own your own heritage, unless you're in command of it, you may share it with the world, but unless you are its primary proprietors, um, you're not really a people. And that has always been your goal? That's where I was growing to and which I... I'm now defining the process retrospectively, I think. But it is true that, as Napoleon put it, that uh, leaders are dealers in dreams. And your leadership has got to have some breadth of mind and some capacity to see relationships in the circumstances around you you need to have a sense of history. You need to realize that uh, history is really a, a large-scale uh, disaster plan. Uh, that, you know, you're planning forward from your understanding of what's happened. You see a statement made in the press and you can recognise it as the same statement being made in 1870 by so-and-so in the House of Parliament. Um, you know that the spirit of white supremacism that emerged in a scientific basis in the uh, 19th century and out of Harvard with Agassiz and those people and Theodore Roosevelt and uh, the people had the same sort of thoughts as Arnold of rugby. Um, 
who gave us the Wastelands Act in New Zealand. You see, that's sort of those theorists and their notions of race supremacy. Uh, you'll still encounter their descendants in ordinary public debate in New Zealand today. It's much less than it was. To some extent, this country has been ill-served by its historical amnesia, which was undertaken quite deliberately. I can remember the Minister of Education who abolished all that civic stuff from the schools and all the constitutional stuff and removed the Treaty of Waitangi from the curriculum. And I was a young lecturer at the time. Mm. I can remember who the Director General of Education was who persecuted Metcalf uh, for his activism against nuclear war. Um, and I can uh, remember the uh, way in which the Maori Women's Welfare League could not handle Wash Day at the Pa and that amazing book of material by Arns Westra. And um, Elsie Locke, the old Pākehā lady from uh, Christchurch who wrote all these amazing school bulletins about children, race relations and things like this. I, I saved boxes of them from the bonfires. Do, do you think one of our biggest problems? But we've got this amnesia. But that same thing, that amnesia that ignorance of our own constitution, our own civics, our own system, um, has had some benefits to the extent that uh, a lot of our young aren't troubled uh, by these historical matters. Of course, it doesn't assist them in thinking forward. They only want to deal with what's now. But it brings me to one of your oft-repeated quotes, which is, we must remember to remember. Yes. That's one of my standard things. In order, because if you own your own memory, you've got some capacity to envisage your own future. Mm. When, so we talked at the beginning about that moment for you, uh, when the settlement was was agreed to and you phoned the Prime Minister. Can you tell me a time in your life where the biggest challenge, something you might have lost, that was the biggest, yeah, the biggest challenge in your life where you think you might have <sighs> dropped the ball, let, 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 let something something's yes. happen. Can you tell me what that was? Yes, it was in the wording of the fisheries agreements with Bulger. What happened? Well, there's a lot of difficulty with your relation, uh, Machu. And um, Graham Latimer deliberately left him at home, I think. He was having trouble with uh, Matt's accounts at the time. And we got it to a stage where there was a window of opportunity uh, uh, and um, we'd had the interim fisheries settlement in 1989, which was basically done with the Labor government. Yes. By the time we sat, as the Maori Fisheries Commission, we had a change of government and Doug Kibb was the minister. Uh, I think it was 91, late 91, the Dutch Queen was visiting, uh, the Queen of the Netherlands, Queen Beatrix, and we were at a reception for her at a hotel in Wellington. And um, the... Uh, uh, Lady Emily was outside, Lady Emily Latimer was outside having a smoke 
and Doug Kidd was there having a smoke and I was out there having a smoke. And um, I went up to Doug and I said, how would you like to get all this litig fisheries litigation out of your hair and move ahead towards a settlement? And uh, he said, how? I said, well, come over here and talk to Graham. And I said, I just offered Doug an idea. And Graham heard it for the first time. I said, buy a Sea Lord. Sea Lord was on the block. It had been, mm -hmm. Carter Holt had been bought by International Paper and they wanted to get rid of the subsidiary. And uh, it started. So Doug Kidd took that to Canberra, to Canberra Cabinet a couple of days later. Cabinet threw him out. And then, so it's a year later, I think we get the Naitahu Sea Fisheries Report is coming out. And it was a triumphant document. And the um, anyhow, the end result was that uh, our man, uh, Doug Kidd, the minister, um, he and I had the embargo reports on a Friday. And he said, he rang me on Saturday, he said, have you read the report? I said, what do you think? And uh, he said, um, is your idea about Sea Lord still available? I said, I think so, but I'll... So I rang Graeme Latimer, I rang Bob Mahuta, and uh, they said, yep, go for it. And so I spent the rest of the weekend in Kid's office with him and Phil Major. Crafting a deal? Crafting what looked like a paper, and on Sunday night we met in Boulder's office. And you thought you had a deal and done and dusted? Yeah, yeah. Well, we thought we had a proposal. Boulder said, right, I know what this is about. Put the case. And so I ended up putting the case with kids' bigger support. And uh, the... Uh, he turned around and he said to Latimer, what about Matt? And I'll speak to Matt, it'll be all right. And Bolter said a critical word. He said, this has got to be for the benefit of all Māori, not just for you four negotiating partners. Now in that context, what he meant was for all iwi. Mm -hmm. But the words all Māori got into the script and let loose subsequently a whole lot of litigation largely run by discordant elements uh, on different grounds. Uh, some who just didn't want to play, so for instance, Nati Perot didn't want to play because Henry Nutter had signed the deed of settlement and his nephew, Apirana Mahuika, hadn't been consulted, so up he was opposed to the fishery settlement. And he set off a bit of litigation there. But you thought you were still going to be able to bring it together? In the end, we did. But the bit that I didn't secure was all iwi instead of all uh, Māori. Why is that Because a the treaty... Well, because that gave rise to years of litigation by urban Māori groups, by all sorts of others, they've still got hang-ups about it, even though they've done very well out of it. Um, but the treaty was between uh, tribes and um, the Crown. And it, provides specifically for individuals in Article 3. But the fisheries 
is in, and those assets are in Article 2. And there's never any question in the forestry settlement that the forests are by iwi. Uh, got it, but this, this hair got loose and various litigious people were able to stretch the fight out in a quite uh, disastrous way, really. And I think my failure there was that I did my own people a huge disservice because, and I'm not being negative towards your own uh, heritage and identity, but the irony is that Ngāpuhi today owns more deep water fish on the Naitahu coast than Naitahu do. What was on the Kahanunu coast than Kahanunu do. And it's because that was a deal that was subsequently done in Parliament between Shane Jones and Helen Clark. What was that like when that final deal came in and you and the result happens? Well, the fishery settlement, uh, people should say I, sh I shouldn't be miserable about it because it's as a consequence of the fishery settlement, which I largely designed, uh, was the provision for customary rights was hugely important. But, but you feel like you let Ngaitahu down? I let Ngaitahu and Kahanunu particularly down, I feel. What was it? So, so what do you, the, I guess the point I'm trying to get well, to... Well, I, all I know is that it's done, and I regard it as a, an outcome which is fundamentally contrary to the treaty. But when but, you say you let Ngaitahu down, are you talking about... Again, all those generations of Ngaitahu who fought for rights and interests. And no, you... I, I think I've, I think I've done better for them overall uh, than might reasonably have been expected of one person. I, I, I don't feel dissatisfied with that. But if I, you ask me for one significant issue, and it comes down to the use of all Maori as distinct from all iwi. Mm. Okay. And uh, although we won the subsequent cases in the court, Parliament ruled over all the tribunal findings and all the court decisions to make the allocation the way it was done. And the fact of the matter is we should not be today having a deep and passionate interest in the Kermadex and what happens up there any more than Napui should have a deep and passionate interest in the Southern Ocean, which they don't, I'm not sure they know it exists. But they, um, that's not the, the, right, the principles of the treaty and the rights of an iwi are similar to the rights of a nation. It's the waters offshore from your territory. But because of the final allocation decision that was made after I was removed uh, was um, that whole set of decisions um, has meant you've got an outcome which is inconsistent with the principles of the treaty and the law of nations. And I still feel that is a major failure. On the other hand, we had a few big wins. I was, I was going to come back to the few big ones. All right. And, um, and I think it's really important to recognise recognize that. So let's go back. The All Blacks just lost in Perth. <laughs> right? <laughs> Less of a win I would have thought to... Well, OK. That. And they were suffering some grievous handicaps in terms of uh, judgments. Well, we've all been there. Yeah. It's... Not so much what you fall down over, it's how you get up. And uh, I, was, I want to see Naitahu in a much more aggressive building mode than in the, its present condition, but that's a matter which I hope I'll be around long enough to ventilate further on. <laughs> so let's come back to a significant win, and in particular in the settlement. One of the things I think lots of people don't recognise is the fact that one of your biggest wins was the recognition 
of the status of ngaitahu. Well, that's the principle of legal personality. That's right. Well, you see, in the 19th century, our legal personality was recognised by the Crown in order to conduct transactions with us. And then as soon as they got their hands on the assets, they turned around and said, I divorce thee, and uh, you no longer exist. And that's right. They, they, that's what they did in the New Zealand yeah, Settlements Act. The Ngaitahu actually didn't exist as, as a people. Well, no, 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 it goes for all as tribes. People, uh, all tribes. Mm. And you had the establishment of the Murray Land Court and all those mechanisms. And, uh, uh, right? And I think it was 1873 or 76, there's a member of the upper house called Rees, R W E S, who wrote a paper who said, when we came to this country, I'll paraphrase it, when we came to this country, it's in a um, appendix, appendix to the House, House, the journals of the House of Representatives. He's an upper house member, ally of Upper Ananatus later. But uh, he said, when we came to this country, uh, we found the most extraordinary thing, that we who had spent nearly 600 years evolving the concept of the joint stock company should arrive in these distant isles, find it in its most near perfect form and immediately set about its destruction. So I'm always very cynical about these uh, do-gooders who talk about the evils of the corporate. And they forget that every self-employed plumber who calls himself a company uh, is a corporate, that he has a legal personality beyond his self, that every corner dairy is a corporate. This is sort of contemporary mm. sniffy language by people. But Ngaitahu even now, this is my understanding, and again, you, I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm wrong, Ngaitahu is still the only... No, two. Two. Yes. Uh, Bob Mahuta rang me and said, hey, what's this stuff you're talking about, this legal personality? I explained it to him. He says, oh, I want one of those. And so I said, well, tell Koro, Koro Wetere, to do it by order and counsel and not let it near the floor of the house because we've had uh, month after month, year after year of negotiating with the select committee over it. Mm. They can't tolerate it. So Ngaitahu Waikoto Tainui are the only we. It's formally, formally recognised. Now I said to Chris Finneson several times on his Minister of Treaty Negotiations, what about their legal personality? So oh, they got it de facto. And uh, I said, it's not good enough. Why is it important? Because it recognises you, your people as a nation, as distinct from you, Julian of Napui. It recognises Napui's identity as Napui. Now we can say, yeah, well, everyone sings to them, everyone does this, but in fact, unless you've got a formal recognition, you don't really have that legal personality as a people. And that to me, it became a very fundamental battle for me. And I remember someone on Radio New Zealand saying, well, what does this mean? I said, well, you might think it doesn't matter because it's, we've now got all the legal status of a $20 shelf company. And said, what do you want that for? And at which point I gave up talking to Radio New Zealand for a week or two. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people don't see the significance of that, that you are a people. Mm. And you've got to think of yourself not as an accumulation of individuals, but you're individuals, but you're also a people. You're a tribal nation. And the notion that Justice Marshall in the United States Supreme Court in 1839, year before the treaty, recognised the bounded sovereignty or encircled sovereignty mm. uh, of Indian tribes. Now, the, you might say their lives were not hugely improved by that recognition, but it's a fundamental thing 
And of course, that's what all their arguments today about casinos and tax and all that stem mm. from. But they do have that status. And if you're a Canadian or you're a treaty, a treaty Indian, you belong to a group of people like that. There's, there's one more point I want to cover with you. I remember, it would have been a couple of years ago, uh, when John Key uh, announced that the United Nations about the Kumedics and the establishment of a sanctuary. You were not well at, in, the, in the days before that. I think you might have actually been in hospital. And when the announcement is made, there's a press conference called, I think in Matangirea, but certainly in Parliament, led by Māori leaders. Um, and my understanding was you were actually in hospital in the immediate uh, establishment of this press conference. And I remember talking to the Hana the day before and asking how you were. The next, the very next day, the press conference happens. And who seems to be holding court but none other than Tati Benero Regan? The situation, that particular situation, isn't the most important thing. The most important thing here is it seems to me that where there is a fight for rights and interests for Māori, that it's important for you to be a part of that, to maybe be a part of the front line, to continue to, to fight for what's right. And that gets you up every day. Am I right or am I completely off base? Oh, well, there's an element of that. I, I, I am, I, I do admit nowadays to a measure of geriatric sloth, but I, uh, I get a, uh, I think I had a very interesting experience in that context because it came off the matter I referred to before, the failure over the fisheries allocation, because one of the things the fisheries allocation did, it made all Māori, quote, uh, it gave all of them interests, or every iwi got interests in uh, the deep sea zones of New Zealand. And we'd had to accept, as a cornerstone of the fishery settlement, the consistency of a quota management system. Uh, we'd had to articulate a treaty right in that through that template, which is probably one of the most intellectually intricate things I've ever done. And I pay great tribute to both Craig Allison and Faimutu Jews for their participation in that exercise with me. But having done that, we said we can sell the quota management system as a device in which Māori treaty rights can be reasonably articulated, apart from the, quota, the customary take. And the Crown desperately wanted us to accept that the, publicly that the uh, quota management system was not contrary to the treaty. And we, they wanted in fact to abolish the treaty provisions in the Maine Fisheries Act. And we dug our, dug our toes in over that. And we finally developed and agreed the wording that the obligations of the Crown under Section 88.2 of the Fisheries Act, that's the mm. one that protects, that gives you the treaty right, protects it, um, are hereby fulfilled. In other words, we refuse to have the treaty wiped out of the fisheries legislation. And um, that was a very difficult phase. And we um, succeeded. Now, as a consequence, the integrity of the fishery settlements, the two fishery settlements, interim of 1989 and main one of 1992, is dependent on the maintenance and proper administration of the quota management system. And the tendency now to try and override the quota management system on all sorts of other grounds is a fundamental, and to do it unilaterally, 
is a fundamental breach of the fishery settlement. So if you can breach a settlement that easily, because some Americans are funding your departments, right? And I say that carefully. The um, if you can override a treaty settlement that easily, simply because it's con currently fashionably convenient to talk about biodiversity and various other theories, then, and you can do that unilaterally, then that is a breach of the Treaty of Waitangi. But, but why are you? Found by the courts. Well, why are you? Because well, no one else was saying it. But you weren't well at the time, Ta. I know. And you've been fine ever since, just quietly. <laughs> It just seems to me that we... I just had this, a bit of major surgery, that's all. Well, well okay. But, but again, you know, you weren't well and here you were and I thought, man, I, what, what... No, how, no, it's, it's, it, look, these things are fundamental. No. We can't talk about treaty and treaty rights. And I've watched with grave disappointment the readiness with which Māori, some, quite a lot of Māori leaders just drops off. They get a settlement and the treaty drops off their, drops out of their brain. They're not following. They're not consistent with it. They don't see it. The only thing that's going to make this country possible in the long term is it's got to have some frame for negotiating the relationships by which we all come together as a nation. And one of the great things that... Uh, uh, Judge Jury did was his statement when he defined uh, Tangata Tiriti, the people who are here by right of treaty and the people who are Tangata Whenua, the people of the land. Now, and he talked about that. And that notion of Tangata Tiriti, the people who are here by right of treaty. So the people who've just got off a plane and landed on a visitor's visa and they're here and they're going to be here for a bit and maybe they'll get long-term residency and maybe citizenship, they become tangata tiriti. Waitangi Day should be the day for citizenship ceremonies. Uh, it's the treaty that makes this nation, which is a highly unlikely nation in all sorts of ways. It's remote, it's irrelevant, it's small. Uh, it's cut in half, some might say, by a beneficent stretch of water. <laughs> um, it's an unlikely little country, probably to some extent now favoured by its remoteness from the madness of northern civilizations cannibalizing each other and themselves at the same time. Um, but if we're going to survive as a people, as a nation, then the treaty gives us a template for negotiating those relationships through. Now, we, can, we could come to an agreement, possibly, over the Kermadex thing, if it was based on evidenced sustainability. That's the principle of the quota management system. We could come to an agreement over all sorts of things if we can find a way which is consistent with it. But what the treaty does do, it means to say, you must negotiate with each other how you're going to bring it forward. The treaty commends you to that negotiation exactly what's happening here at Ihu Mata, as I understand it at the moment. I don't know what the resolution will be, but the thing that commends you to negotiation, commends the Crown to negotiate and find a way through is the tertiarity. And so it's got uh, three articles. That's my trinity. Final question. Your wife is an extraordinary woman. Uh, one, because 
she's been married to you for a long time. <laughs> but because uh, you have been able to lead, to fight, to be on the front line. And I wonder whether or not you would have been enabled to do that had you married someone else, had you not met Lady Sandra. Well, our beloved friend, now past, Teowe Davis of Maniapoto, always argued that, um, that um, no Māori woman would ever put up with me. Now, that may or may not have been true, but uh, the uh, <coughs> she had various dreams of her own, and she had quite a, a promising career, which I managed to metaphorically harpoon uh, with multiple pregnancies. <laughs> but the, uh, she has been uh, an absolute rock. When our youngest daughter, Hannah, went to school, she enrolled. She was, had wanted to be, always wanted to be a doctor. And it was the only job she could get was working in the government. And she was, the late Bill Such, Dr. Such, had some dream of her being New Zealand's first woman trade commissioner. Uh, and he always used to take every opportunity for publicly uh, criticising me and taking pot shots at me because I'd deprived him of this ambition for <laughs> my wife. <laughs> but um, the uh, uh, she had had a um, she trained as a nurse. She became a top end nurse. She became a specialist neonatal nurse. She flew the helicopters uh, with Peter Button at low altitudes by night with babies on uh, respirators. And mm. House surgeons scared out of their wits and she's nursing the house surgeons as much as the babies, I think, making life, to, life and death decisions over which child gets the respirator. And we worked for many years on a sort of hotbed principle with our families. Uh, that, uh, she'd go to bed and I'd, uh, she'd come home and go to bed and I'd get up and do what had to be done. And uh, So I did a lot of cooking and things like that while I was, but it was a routine that we got into. But I had nearly 11 years of negative income and uh, it was Sandra who carried the gap between the mortgage and five children, and mm. all of those things, and she was, so she's been the rock of all that. And, and she's still the only person you fear, I understand. Well, I, I pretend fear. <laughs> you pretend pretty well, if I can say that. <laughs> it almost seems real. <laughs> Well, yes, but she has had some great personal pain from negative perceptions of me and what I was involved with, with my own family and these within the family, family extended family. And that was very painful for her and difficult and challenging. And she's uh, stood by through all that. And um, so... Uh, yes, it's patently obvious, I think, that um, I could not have been able to, I would not have been able to do what I did if I hadn't had her support. Mm. But she understood most of it and she retains a somewhat cool eye on much of what I do. But I'm still at it. I'm now largely involved with the archives and mm. archival histories of Maitahu the development of Kahuru Manu and that whole knowledge base comes back to my opening thing about uh, there's no point having a whole lot of heritage 
and a whole lot of identity and your own tribal stories and everything. If all that in is locked in state archives. And so there's the business of making them accessible to your people, running programs by which your people may become more understanding. There's a one rather wonderful line of Marshall Salem, the American uh, University of Chicago anthropologist. He has left us some wonderful quotes about these things, but he said one of the things that marks indigenous people is that the first thing they do when engaging with a new technology, a new concept, a new way of doing things, new forms of art, is to adopt them so as to become more like themselves. And so the musket with the carved butt becomes a Maori gun. The fish hook, uh, the iron fish hook that's been reshaped to make the Maori revolving fish hook becomes a Maori fish hook. The, and so you could say uh, the souped up hot rod with a big cool fi fi down the side becomes a Maori cow. But that's what Salins is saying. And I think that's what we're doing. We're making, we're carving, we're recarving the house of Tahu. We're reshaping ourselves and our different ways and iwis into new futures. But we must command our own memory. <laughs>